I'm going to get it started. So basically with this concept of this, you kind of want to just dig into what's called sustainability of self. So first off, again, Matt, thank you for, ha for having me here and chatting. But it's all to you this concept of sustainability of self. And you'll start to understand as I kind of go through this to talk a little bit more about my work and why this is important um, and why to build this out. Because I know in, your, in, in the class and looking through your syllabus and the work that you do, it's entrepreneur oriented and, and, and it has a bent towards social enterprise and sustainability. But, and this is the thing that they don't really teach you about in college, is um, you gotta figure out how to sustain yourself and you gotta figure out really how to find your purpose before you pour your purpose into work. Um, so just building that out and kind of moving forward with that. Just a quick about me, so I'll kind of get this out the way. Um, it's okay, you can yawn. I know I'm very boring, but it's fine. I'm totally just kidding. Um, I'm Joe Holder. I'm founder of something that's called the Ocho System, <laughs> co-founder of a nonprofit called System of Service. I'm a Nike master trainer. I also write for GQ. I'm a health and wellness consultant, and I kind of got my start first in personal training. Uh, I'm one of seven children. I was born in Montana. I was a premature kid which gave me a lot of insight into a few things. I grew up in New Jersey, South Orange, New Jersey. If anybody is from Jersey out there, stand up. Um, but with all these things that I do, which I'll kind of talk about later, it's all through this kind of really one consistent through line, which is just figured out how to uh, improve people's health and kind of wellness overall. So <clears throat> this kind of just goes back into a little bit more about, you know, my work and the things that, and the things that I do to, to kind of keep that concise. Um, and, uh, basically I've kind of created this fitness philosophy, this wellness philosophy called the Ocho system that kind of stands for one could help others and others could help, uh, one. And this kind of mindset that if you take care of yourself first and you could go better out in the world and surf, which I think makes sense. And then it's kind of a design philosophy of wellness that I come out of ideas with. So it was my nonprofit system of service, which hits another component of wellness, where it's exercise snacks, it's just as an onboarding ramp to kind of get you moving simple and easy to make things go well. It's kind of a, uh, a, a social enterprise philosophy, philosophy, I like to say. So from there, what I think becomes important because you're in school and you hear about so many things and you're like, why is this stuff even important? I think it's important to know that there's so many just kind of points of inspiration that, that it stems from the work that I've done. So. And this is one of the things that, you know, we'll talk about later, but I really want to get through y'all because even though school seems so much like a headache, you have access to so much knowledge or perhaps information that you can turn into knowledge. So a lot of the times you'll find little nooks and crannies in areas that you don't even think are relevant that are. So something like tickles your fancy, for lack of a better term, and something that's not directly attributable to what you think you are working on, follow that thread. Okay, please follow that thread. So as we build it out, though, it's like you guys probably hear a whole bunch of people and it's like, I just like to cut to the chase. It was like, why am I here and why does it matter? I'm here because, of course, Matt hit me up. I'm also here because, you know, in the 10 years since I've been out of school, I've, I've been, been able to do some things that other people have not been able to do. I'm not going to say I'm filthy rich. You know, I like to call myself a Henry. I'm a high earner, not rich yet, they like to say. Um, but I've, I've done things that are the, uh, the first in their industry. I've done things that people didn't think made sense or were possible. And that's not it really as a result of me trying to find my personal freedom and not work in a standard way and also make the world a better place. And then it's, okay, why does that matter? That matters because maybe for 45 minutes or 30 minutes, and at the end of the day for the students here too, please interrupt me because I want it to be an open-ended discussion, but it matters because maybe for these next 30 minutes that there's just something that I can tell, tell you that can break through at this crucial juncture, I think of existence that we're in, that can not just help make the, make the world a better place, but make you better, make you feel a little bit better, make you move forward, I think, consistently, deliberately, and kind of with a better, but with a better, hopefully, fortitude for life. So when we talk about sustainability, I always like to frame it, right? Because it's like, why is this, entre this kid who's in health and wellness or perhaps an entrepreneur coming to me to talk about sustainability? Because often when we hear about sustainability, especially as it's framed right now, what do you typically hear about, right? You hear about all these huge, large problems that seem overbearing, that the world is on fire, but it's also, it's also you know, cooling very fast. And it's also a situation where we're about to go at war, then maybe we're not. 
and I, I, maybe I can eat fish, maybe I can't, maybe it's just like, what is going on? I like to say, hold up, this is all fair and fine, but step one, which is, you know, I like to say a hard truth, none of us here cons consented to existence. How many of here, I would love to know because you have a superpower, how many of you here were say, you know what, whatever you believe in, if you believe in God or not, you're like, Buddha, I want to I wanna go down to earth for a little bit, set me down. If you can remember that, please go get studied because I think it's important. But none of us were consented to existence. None of us. You were here, here. There's a point where you realize you're here and then you're like, well, I got to do something. So it's a sustainability goal. Number three, I think is super important. Good health and well-being. That is a form of sustainability. Taking care of yourself and health is a form of sustainability. So the sustainability of self concept is what I'm here to talk to you about is how can we make ourselves have improved good health and well-being and also make the world a better place. But I don't think you could do any of these other 16 that are present without three. But everybody overlooks this. You don't have one class in college or maybe you do now, but you don't have one class in college, I think, that talks to you about how to take care of yourself. And that's bizarre. That's crazy. So uh, we're going to talk about that today a little bit. So, you know, I always like to do a little research on y'all. So, I, you know, I sat down, took a step back, saw what y'all are talking about in this class. And there's three things that I th thought that were important and crucial. And I'll frame this discussion before, you know, we really get in it. Talk about the nonprofit, se nonprofit sector, impact related for profit sector, which I think is key and is growing. Entrepreneurial part of our economy, which has always been relatively robust. You know, you have the great resignation, I'm sure you've heard, but really what that is, is more people starting their own businesses because unemployment is still down and they're still doing a little bit of gig working. So I think the entrepreneurial mindset and energy is picking up. And then also, you know, you guys had to work directly with social enterprises, guys and girls, and, and however uh, one may relate, had to work directly with the social enterprise. So those three big things I think are super key. And that takes me, as we got to ground this, into my time at Penn, because I get a lot of questions, right? I don't, I've, been, I've been lucky to be in a lot of magazines. I've been lucky to be on a lot of podcasts. And everybody asks me the same damn questions. How do you get these models? How did you get these models in shape? How did you start your fitness journey? How did you do this? How did you do that? But what I often don't get asked about, and that's why I love coming to talk about this class, is the other side, was the work that I did in a nonprofit in my time at UPenn that helped me learn a lot. So real quick, I'm gonna, you know, I like, I like to tell stories because I think that's uh, more interesting. And I've also been in a seat that you all were. Where I was undergrad, I went to the University of Pennsylvania. I, I, had a, I studied sociology with a concentration in medicine. I minored in psychology and marketing. And I probably also majored in being miserable for a time, which was the worst thing, because everybody probably knows undergrad. I dealt with a football injury. I broke my, uh, or I hurt my ankle really bad. I later broke my leg. I'll save that story. But I hurt my ankle really bad and I became depressed. And I thought I wanted to figure out how to make my body heal. That's kind of where the Ocho system found it. And we know undergrad, a lot of people, you do struggle with mental, mental wellness. Um, and I realized my body wasn't healing because I was so sad. So I wanted to figure out why that was, what was going on. And I started to realize once I took care of my mental state and I had a better way of eating and, and, and approaching my physical, then my body started to heal. There's other couple of things that I, that I realized that were important in my undergrad experience where I took Angela Duckworth's class. She didn't write this book great yet. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it, but she was basically workshopping the book on our class. And she was talking about a lot of her work that she was doing and how to improve this mindset. I also took Jonah Berger's class. He was also workshopping this book, Contagious, on us. And it taught me a lot about how to make ideas kind of stick and how about if we use kind of for-profit models for better. I also worked for two social enterprises or nonprofits. One was called the Agustin Urban Nutrition Initiative. I was their athletic director and also nutritional development services. I was helping feed kids in Philadelphia and working with the Archdiocese of Philly to make things a little bit more real, trying to get uh, summer meals to these kids because a lot of these kids were hungry. I don't know if all of you have worked at a social enterprise yet, but you will realize it is a mess, it is underfunded, and a lot of people don't know what they're doing. 
So I thought about combining these ideas and I would say I learned at UPenn to then bring them together with some of the experiences I had in the real world to make to, to, to make them stick. And then another time at UPenn that was very key was, you know, I don't know if you, uh, you guys aren't on campus, but on campus, we would have these free lunches. We would have these free lunches if you went and got to talk to, and had a lecture. So for me, these free lunches were key because I was hungry. I didn't have that much money. Chipotle, you could only eat so many times. And basically, I was like, yo, let me go hear some lectures so, these, so I can get free food. But I went to this one lecture and this lecture changed my life. And this is why I, one of my things is always show up. Even when you're not sure, always show up. I also got my first job just from showing up to somebody inviting me to something. But I would say, always show up. You don't know where it'll go. So there's this guy, this South African guy, I think, or maybe Swiss, but it's Professor James Thompson. He talks a lot about social entrepreneurship. And I just want to share this clip real quick from one of his lectures. And it's captions in case the sound doesn't work. But because, or this talk that he gave, because it's, it's such a click too for anything that anybody here wants to do. The first thing um, when we learned of this uh, that we did was to sit down with the entrepreneur and say, all right, what is success for you? And uh, how do you know when you've got there? And as simple as that sounds, turns out that a lot of folks don't really think like that. Honestly, that 25 second clip and know that question, how do you measure success and how do you know when you've got there? Will not just change your work life, it'll change your life. It'll literally change your life because it'll allow you to frame not just your, your personal work, but also your life work and the work that you do on yourself to create parameters for what you want to deem successful, not what other people tell you is success. And that's one of the key things, whether it's with your personal social enterprise work or your work, if you don't know how you define success, nor do you know how you're gonna get there, you're gonna be lost your whole life. So that's, step, that's, that's, that's step one. And I went and talked to him after I had saw him speak and he gave me two key things that were super important. And I'm just gonna pass them on because you can use them or you cannot. That's fine. It's your choice. It's like with health and wellness. But what he told me was there's two things that you need to do. One, you need to change the way that you think. You have to change the way that you think. And that's why mental models and mental frameworks, Charlie Munger, all his work, I'm such a fan of. Because you change the way you think for the better, you can literally change the world and see blind spots that other people can't see. Right. So entrepreneurial mindset, super good book. It's a little dense, but it's, it's just thought process behavior that helps us reduce uncertainty in the things that we're doing because that's what the issue is it's not risk it's uncertainty is the problem because risk you can manage there's literally risk management uncertainty is like you literally just don't know a bunch of things so you're out there doing guesswork right so this was a, a, a super important suggestion that he gave to me but then and this was a 20 i've never talked to this man again by the way i need to shoot him an email because he's literally helped make me successful and he has no idea. He probably doesn't remember talking to me. So I emailed him after this lunch, after the nice free meal, and I said, yo, I want to meet with you. And that's another thing. Reach out to people who you, uh, I don't know if I could curse, but reach out to people who you like because you'll never know if they, they'll respond and it could literally change your world. And one of the things he also told me, because he was asking me what it is that you want to do, you know, I was talking about all the other work that I've previously done. All the other work. I'm a 19 year old kid, you know, 20 year old kid. I haven't done anything. You know, I worked in retail and then I had those other jobs or whatever. But he was like, Look, I was telling him I had all these great ambitions and dreams and aspirations. And he was like, Look, you're focusing too much on yourself. What you need to do is you need to be the Tylenol and figure out what are the problems of others that you can solve. So he said, and then also essentially branded correctly. So Tylenol, you know, whatever, it's just ibuprofen basically, but it's branded very well and it has trustworthiness and it's able to then solve other people's problems. So he said, be the Tylenol. If you always figure out a problem to, that you can solve, you'll always have success. And then building off that, he also had this framework again for reducing uncertainty. That's called discovery driven planning. With a lot of people who have their own ideas, won't go through because one, they think their idea is often the best, especially when you're young. They don't know, if, they don't really look if other people are working on these things. And then they don't want to stress test. Look, 
and this is not just for work. We're going to get into the personal stuff in a second, but life is just one big stress test. And you could do two things. You could either learn from it and not make the same mistake again, or you just keep kind of throwing shit at the wall and hope it sticks. So discovery driven planning, and I'm, the easiest thing to do with a lot of this, I'll just send Matt some uh, links that hopefully you could just read later. But it's just a simple framework, you know, HBR, probably 1995, how to go from possible, which is the uncertainty angle, from to plausible, probable, and then be able to essentially plan it out, mitigate the risk. And then once you basically try things, keep starting, keep starting, and discover through that lens, it makes it easy. But just to bring it all together, through this social enterprise model, both for for-profit and nonprofit, like I've been able to come up with ideas and ideas that have relatively been successful. So System of Service is a nonprofit I started that I was like, look, like why aren't people just trying to make the world a better place, right? So I wanted to stress test that. It basically set up infrastructures to help people partic participate in service events. But what I realized was, was all right, what'll make this unique? How can I be the Tylenol? Was that companies have these huge CSR goals, but they do not know how to actually re either reach populations or make it interesting. So I basically will work with companies because everybody wants to be in the cool kid culture mix to set up structures that they essentially would pay for, put the money back into communities in a way that makes sense and allow the community to participate in essentially uh, uh, social give back actions. And then exercise there, the Ocho system, of course, is for profit, but it kind of connects more so to enabling oneself to act and live better. And I like to just say I'm a sponsored educator. I get paid to teach, which I'm lucky to do in a way that's decentralized, but it has a community and a give back angle. And then exercise snacks. Basically, it's a philosophy that was started that showed that small workouts work well, but it's basically community funded. Right. So my thing with that is, you know, the social enterprise model, it's is how can I tie in with the things that I sell a give back model, but how can I also give back and open source information, because I do also think that's a form of social enterprise. So taking those concepts and formulating both nonprofit or for profit ideas that allow me to have success, allow me to make money, but also allow me to feel a little bit better about myself. So as we, and I hope can make other people feel better too. That's the most important thing. But there is a conundrum that I'm gonna be honest about with you all that nobody likes to say, that perhaps being selfless is the most selfish thing you could do because if you make other people feel good, you'll feel better too. So who cares? We all went out and it becomes a philosophical debate, but if you help other people, you'll feel all right. So the ultra system is basically built around kind of these eight dimensions so I think are key and we're kind of getting to the sustainability of self aspect, but you got to take care of your emotional health, your spiritual health, your intellectual, physical, environment, financial, occupational too. And if you get a little bit bigger than a lot of people try to make it, which is, and of course, social connection, but people just try to make it about the physical when that's not it. So when we're talking about taking care of yourself and making this world a little bit of a better place, Think about all these other areas that also impact your health. And then these eight areas are essentially the wellness strategies in which you could do them through. So really focusing on that for the better um, and not get caught up kind of, because I couldn't imagine this social media age, which y'all got to deal with, going on TikTok, going on Instagram. I mean, I'm a kid of Twitter and, and, and MySpace, really. You know, you get curated. I, I had to code what my page looked like. I mean, now you just kind of go on there and you got people throwing all this stuff at you. And essentially, the, I don't think the mental well-being that it has is, is good. But that's a discussion for another day. But I just briefly will just want to talk to, and, you know, touch upon one of my mentors and, and, and relative, you know, heroes in this space. And God rest his soul, he recently passed. And just to show how this for-profit social enterprise model can work. And it can work in a way that can literally change the world. And, you know, Virgil Abloh, for those of you who don't know, but, you know, he's the founder of Off-White. He was the head of uh, Louis Vuitton Men's. Um, he also, you know, started a whole bunch of behind-the-scenes social enterprise work that literally changed the world. And uh, all of it was, he wanted it all to mean something. And one of, you know, his favorite quotes of mine was, there's nothing, nothing more important than designing the new generation. It wasn't the clothes. It wasn't the chairs. It wasn't the chains. 
who was designing the new generation and, and coming up and able, and able to make the world a little bit of a better place. And this is real quick. I want to go to this one mark here. So that is like, you know, just a short clip to show that, you know, like African-American Black studies within art, you know, manifest themselves in different ways and is largely taught. And there's so many great initiatives in this moment of 2020 that are based around education, history, and also different canons. You know, there's the white canon of, you know, classic pieces of art, but there's also the black canon that exists and those stories need to be heard and told and shared with the same sort of um, institutionalized sort of metric that everything else is. And then that's how I believe our world sort of abolishes systemic racism and gets towards a playing field that's more diverse so that more people feel included in the conversation. And again, I just think if you're going to the Royal College of Art, you should be listening, you should be seeing sort of canons of black art in that clip with Jeff Mills of Detroit uh, Techno. And there's also one other clip that I want to show that I don't think was brought here, but it's important. Actually, I'll just talk about it. So he talks about two things. He talks about this concept of canon, basically the, the standard things that we've been taught and whether it's black canon, whether it's women canon, whether it's whatever, non-heteronormative canon, whatever the other canons that we haven't been taught that need to be talked about or can, be, can provide inspiration. There's also another discussion I feel also because you know YouTube sharing gets a little bit weird, where a student asked him, with everything that's going on with whatever Black Lives Matter, how do you feel that companies are going to be able to respond? And you just think they're just going to use it in a way that you know just pushes it under the table. And what he said is pretty profound. He just goes, regardless of what they do, I've made the deliberate decision to believe that I'm an optimist. I have you have I have to wake up and say that I'm an optimist, and I think that I can work forward to make the world better with what it is that I have and a seat at the table that I have. To sustain oneself, when you are battling heart cancer, when you are battling cancer to say, you know your time is limited, that I am an optimist and I believe what I can do can change the world for the better, regardless if one is sick or not, to get up and say that, extremely profound to sustain oneself through that lens, extremely profound, and also to do the work. But the other thing that he, he, he kind of he kind of talked about and, and he said was having to do this essentially through a Trojan horse angle and having people show up to do the work. However you feel about Black Lives Matter, I know there's a lot of things that went just went down in Minnesota and it was very tough and it was very hard to see. I have a lot of feelings about Black Lives Matter because I don't ever think an ideology should be tied to just strictly an organization because an organization is fallible and when an organization messes up, it messes everything up. But it's thought process that whatever, Black Lives Matter too, or some subjugated populations lives matter too. There's no debate there. We, whether it's about socioeconomic condition, race, gender, whatever, everybody, we should all just have a chance to live and to live well. And to live and to live with the ability to flourish. That just should be a, hu a human right. So, with the ability to like show up and essentially, you know, you know I challenge myself that. too. It's like to do this. One of our conversations that we have that I just want to be able to show because you guys have to be able to set up these structures if you want to make the world a better place. Was we had a conversation, he shot me a, a note, we talked, and then he drew this which is basically, again, a design system to not just sustain oneself, but sustain one's effort, which is super important. How to sustain effort, come up with a roadmap, come up with a roadmap. One of the smartest dudes in the world sat down, he said he didn't have the answers and he came up with them. Stop thinking you have the, all the answers if you can't come up with a roadmap, because what did he really do? What did we talk about earlier? We talked about stress testing and having discovery-driven planning. This is discovery-driven planning. This started with a piece of paper, right? This man who now has all this access said he wants to retell old stories. He wants to figure this out, big moves, fight low and high. He has LV, he has Nike, he has all this other stuff. He has a website, starts with this piece of paper. This is a first social enterprise model. And not to say anything I've done is special, but all ideas start on paper, but that's what makes However you feel about anything greater than yourself, that's what makes you divine. 
when, you know, Michelangelo, I think it was, drew the picture of God and touching Adam and the finger. What's powerful about that is not the photo. What's powerful about that is that if you scan that, you know what that is? It's a cross section of a brain. They saw that all those things fit together to be the cross section of a brain. And what makes us all special is the fact that we can come up with these ideas, put them on paper and make them real. So use that and then do something powerful with it. Create, create, create. That's what I implore all you to do, but you can't create until you take care of yourself. But create, create, please, please. It's up to us. It's up to y'all. Hopefully y'all are smarter than the generation ahead of you because you should be standing upon the benefits that they give you. So again, expert generalist model, be well-versed, build these things, free game. He out, he open source information, postmodern. He created a million dollar plus uh, scholarship fund by tapping into the for-profit structures to help individuals that may need a little bit of help. And then from there, he just raised, you know, God bless him, rest his soul, $25 million by auctioning some sneakers. How crazy does that sound for a scholarship fund? He came up with this idea, and they're beautiful ass sneakers. I don't have that pair, but I have a pair. It's beautiful ass sneaker. But what makes this sneaker special is what it represents. It represent it can represent a conduit for a new generation because he now just raised twenty five million dollars for a fashion scholarship to help people who may not have access to certain things be better, be, be like to be better. And that's what makes it powerful. That's what makes it, you know, super inspirational. And that's what I hope he could, he could pass on. So this thought process, this, this process of obtuse goal attainment, because that's the true American dream. I don't know if anybody watched the Super Bowl, but it's like, ooh, 10, 20, 30 years ago, when you would think that Snoop Dogg would smoke a joint and then go perform at the halftime of the Super Bowl show. When he's probably one of the most hated pop culture figures, you know, when, you know, by Reagan and the rest. That's up to Skull Attainment. On the left, you know, you have uh, Marcel Duchamp, big artist. On the right, you have Gucci Man, went to jail, came out, turned his life around. But as Black Cannon, as you know, as Virgil alluded to, is telling these untold stories that are often can be heroic, can, can be inspirational, and can, can help make the world a better place. So that's one thing that I want to be, be able to implore upon you all, not just because, you know, I love that man and he's he definitely one of my best friends, but the fact that there are ways to get to where you want to go that aren't standard. And if you can figure out how to get there, do so. Please do so. And he's also figure out how to make the world a little better as you do it, do it. So stop thinking you have to go that same road. You know, you don't want to go on some road less travel type of thing. Because a lot of times you do have to go down the well-traveled road before, road before you make your own path. But if you can obtuse it, if you can, you know, use things that could be a catalyst to get you to where you want to be, do it. So real quick, bear with me. Seems to have frozen here. What we're going to want to do, there we go, is that, again, I take inspiration from a lot of random places. I work hard so I could just free up my time to read some books. So I really don't gotta be bothered. That's like my MO. But I read a lot of Kierkegaard because I'm an existentialist. I believe you have to create your future, your create your reality. And one of his thought processes he has is he's always in a process of becoming, which I think is key, like constantly being in a process of becoming. And you all are at a foundational age where that's one of your things. You're in, a, you're in the process of becoming. And it's tough. There's a lot of things that happen, a lot of heartbreaks, you know, whether your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whatever it may be, or not having a partner, a lot of family changes. It's hard. A lot of people don't want to admit that it is. I'm not going to say it necessarily gets easier, but there's some ways that you can learn how to deal with it. And I'm also the believer that you, a lot of people say life is long, but each phase of your life ain't long. The, where you are now is where you are now, and that's not what it's going to be later. So I think there are things that you can learn from that along the way, and it can compound on each other, hopefully, to make things a little bit better. So this process of constantly becoming, 
you know, that's what I like to do. I like to do this thing called lessons and questions, because also it allows me to sit down and think about the things that I've previously done, but also hopefully provide a little bit of knowledge or a catalyst or whatever, something that gets you just to feel a little bit different, think a little bit different, move a little different. Because, you know, that's, that's how I think you pay it forward. So I think one of the big questions, we're just gonna go through a few of these and then open it up for Q and A. So please have some questions ready so I can be late for my next Zoom meeting. Um, is, why do you think the way you think? And why is the world the way that it is? And I think this is important because, you know, in a world of the Joe Rogans and the Jordan Petersons and the Libertarians is that everybody thinks their individual feelings are the most important when and that's the only world. When what you have to realize is there's more than one world. It depends upon the context of mutual agreement. If I feel one way and you feel a different way, can one really say that's the same world in which we exist? I'm a black man. Matt's a white dude, or you know, we have white women in this class, or whatever. Can we both agree that our worlds are the same? No, but I think you could come upon a context that is a mutual agreement that's important. So that's how you understand how to move through the world, because you have to be able to think outside yourself. And that also make it easier to come up with ideas. Adam Grant talks about this with fellow feeling and empathy. And, you know, know him as a father of capitalism. But he talks about a lot of other things that make the world a lot easier. Um, or excuse me, Adam Smith to talk about make the world a lot easier. But stop thinking that your world is the only one. Stop it. Like, come up, of course, with your code of ethics, but the world's bigger than you. So make sure you do realize that. And another one, it's going to be realized it's all fake. You have to, it's like, you know, there's the meme where, the, where whatever, they're cutting the moon and it's like, it's always been cheese or something, or it's always been cake. It's like those weird cake memes. I'm probably aging myself because that's probably an old meme. But anyway, it's you have to realize to an extent that it's all fake, but it just has real implications. But if you realize it's all, all fake, you get out of the cognitive dissonance that's often associated with being basically, you know, a little bit of a, a nihilist, I suppose, which is you get downtrodden. You're like, what's the point of doing anything? Da, 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 what's this? What's that? Again, you know, you didn't consent, but to existence at least, but you do know if it's all fake, just with real implications, you get kind of you could kind of create your own rules for flourishing, which is important. So don't get caught. And also it allows you to, to find opportunities because you know everybody talks about whatever crypto or NFTs now, but it go even going further back, you look at the internet, you look at the invention of the wheel, whatever. Enough, it was all fake until it was accepted and then it became real. So instead of thinking that how the world is now is the only way it'll ever be, why think that way? like open up the realms of, 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 of possibilities. And then this is another thing because, uh, you know, you hear about imposter syndrome all the time. You hear about this, you hear about that. You got to think about, does it matter how much you know or does it matter how much you do? And I think this is a super, key, super key because a lot of the times people say, oh, I don't have this, so I can't do this. I didn't study this, so I can't do this, you know? And then you also get caught up in the thinking that learning is a form of action when learning, of course, is the pre-work, but it isn't the actual work. So just realize you have to do the work and it's, it, it's tough and it kind of is what it is, but you're going to have to do the work. So <laughs> just to be honest with you, and it's not to say, you know, everybody, anybody's soft or anything, but it's just, it's become a time where you just have to realize, especially in the beginning, there's going to be work that you have to do. And this is, an, I didn't include this one, but like, that's why yes and no are the two most important words you ever learn. Because in the beginning, you're going to have to say a yes to a lot of things you don't want to say yes to in the sense of getting your foot in the door or, or making sure that things line up accordingly for you to have the opportunity. And then no, because you got to be selective with your energy, which is something that, that's important as you move forward in your life and your career is don't have energy, too many energy leeches in your life, because that'll be tiring. And then that'll, that'll kind of reduce your ability to do better work later. So from there, and this is another one that I wish I was told earlier on, and I'm going to tell you all right now, is that you hear all this stuff that money doesn't matter. All right, time over money versus money over time. But over time, money matters. It's real. 
So this is why financial health is super important. But it's thought process that, look, they say there's a certain threshold or a certain level of happiness if you realize that you have more of your time that is available, right? Instead of just thinking, I'm going to try to go out and try to get as rich as possible. I'm going to try to use my, you know, I'm just going to try to use my money and that'll free up time later. And then that doesn't really, that doesn't really skew towards, towards making someone, you know, happy, unfortunately. So the thing is, is, and this is the easiest way to distill this. Do not waste your 20s trying to be a hedonist because your 20s, you have the road, you have the ability to fail early and to, and, and to realize what are the better ways later I can use my time for money so I don't have all my, my essentially time eaten up and I'll be able to make a livelihood because over time money matters. You waste your 20s and you try to play catch up in your 30s, especially for financial matters, you do not want to do that. So don't, of course, just put, you know, the pedal to the metal very early on and grind yourself out and burn out. But do realize financial health is important. It's not just about making money. It's understanding budgeting. It's, under, it's understanding saving. It's understanding whatever if you need to invest in. It's understanding life insurance. It's understanding retirement. Over time, money matters. Do not let people tell you that money doesn't matter. That money doesn't buy happiness, whatever. It does not buy happiness, but it provides access to a thir certain threshold for you to be able to, to, be able to live well, because that's the world, unfortunately, we live in. This doesn't mean go chasing money. This just means being honest about the implications and what, are, and what is present so you can feel better about yourself while not having money anxiety. So just get good financial habits early, okay? It's super important. And another one, it's, do you know the rules or are you just trying to throw out the rule book? Because this is a thing that we see is a lot of people say, oh, I have this idea. They don't go and study the industry. They try to come in or it's, it's not in a context that works for them. And then they're like, I failed. I don't get why. Because you don't know the rules. It's so it's easier to innovate, although people don't want to admit this. It's easier to innovate when you know the rules. Because then, then you could either throw out the rule book or you could look at those little nuances that people don't pay attention to. So I'm gonna give two examples. Example one is a personal example. I remember in high school, I was always late for school because I had to commute about two hours every day and I was tired and I loved to sleep in. So my mom will tell you if you ever meet her and her wonderful stories. But I looked at the handbook you know what the handbook said? The handbook said, because I played sports too, so I, I thought, always thought I had to get on time. The handbook said, as long as you were in school before 1030, you will get detention, but you could still participate in sports. So you know what I did? Because that rule book said I could. On the days where I knew, I would show up late, still be able to participate in sports. And if I had a test for a period that, you know, maybe I didn't feel like taking, I get come in a little late, take it the next day. I followed the rules. I knew the rules so I could throw out the rule book and still make it. I graduated top five in my class. I knew the rules. Then another example is Bill Belichick, football coach. He knows the rule book back to front and he uses that for competitive advantage. So if you can know certain rules, and I like to say the algorithms of life to use that for your advantage, please use it. And don't just think because of this, I have this idea, I'm gonna ignore everything else. I'm just gonna go my own way. That might not always be the best route. You might get lucky, but a lot of the times uh, that's just really the result of hubris. And there's another one is there's always something to be learned even if it is nothing. Because, and this is why I don't always read things that I agree with. And I think it's important to introduce yourself to other viewpoints is Sometimes when you're in a situation, you realize that there's nothing to be learned here. It's not serving you. That's a vital aspect of critical thinking. And that then allows you to understand when something you're doing doesn't serve a purpose, that you're not just doing it to doing it, because then also you're just wasting your time. So if you do realize there's something you're doing and you critically look at it and you realize I'm not getting any value from this, don't continue on. OK, because then that's when you could pivot accordingly or pivot uh, quickly. And that one, you actually have learned something because you realize it isn't applicable. And then two, you continue to move forward and save your time. This is another thing I think is young is important for you all to know. 
and as you kind of develop your codes. And there's another thing here. Some of these things you may not agree with, totally fine. But that, again, is just with the last lesson. Maybe it doesn't apply to you, but it allows you to kind of create your framework so you can know what does apply to you. I think understanding the difference between your purpose versus your why is super key. Because with this is that sometimes if you have your purpose might be a little bit deeper, but why you're doing something at that moment, you know, might be a little bit more short term, say, whatever, I may just need this opportunity, or I may just be trying to learn a little bit more. So if you're able to delineate between your purpose and your why, it doesn't get as difficult because there's some things you're going to have to do that you just don't want to do. And but but if you know it'll lead towards your deeper purpose, that dissonance that's often associated, especially with in, in the beginning of life or the beginning of your adult life, you're gonna struggle with that a lot because there's just certain areas you can't yet reach, and you're like, why am I doing this? But if you're very aware of your deeper purpose, you could kind of kind of get through that, and you won't you know necessarily be at that spot that you're you don't want to be at forever, but it'll help you serve something for your greater purpose as you move forward and this is another thing that i like to share because everybody thinks whatever things are honky dory that everything is sweet that everything is going to be easy that the pie is always integrative you know when sometimes it is distributive so i don't believe everything is a zero-sum game but i like to say and it's helped me very early in my career there is a scorched earth philosophy as sometimes you do something so somebody else can't and that if you're going to be the only person that can plant this seed, it's going to be you that can plant that seed. It's not going to be other but somebody else that's going to get it. So an easy example of this is that sometimes the uh, you know as early on freelancing or having to do stuff for free, the rate that I would be paid or the job opportunities I would get wouldn't make sense. But then I would say if I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it, and I might provide them an opportunity with what I, I won't have access to. So, you know, something that I did early on was I did this talk for free that ended up leading to, a, you know, a very good deal that helped me. And I did, uh, I've done a few of those things, which is basically you step up to the plate sometimes because you're going to scorch the earth. That this might be an opportunity that might prove fruitful for you, but if it doesn't prove fruitful for you, you're going to make sure it's not fruitful for anybody else. And nobody wants to talk about the, you know, that aspect that exists, but it's, but it's, uh, but it's, it's real. And, uh, you know, Paul, there's this guy, Paul Graham, who talks about this, that, you know, does some work with Y Combinator and he invests, but it's this thought process of, would you rather have a crazy new idea or a forgotten old one? I personally think you go for both. A crazy new idea, is, is, especially if somebody who is an, is an expert or has domain knowledge and something they say sounds a little bit crazy, do your fact checking, but it just might work. So if you are really good at what you do, or you're really immersed in that knowledge base area and you have a crazy new idea and other people write it off, don't necessarily write it off yourself, especially if you're very versed. I did that earlier in my career and it hurt me a lot. And because everything that I thought was gonna come true ended up coming true, but I didn't take advantage of it because people looked at me like I was nuts. And the other one is sometimes look for forgotten old ideas, which is, you know, as you all move forward and you're trying to figure out your career and your life, what are some of those older nuances that people have just overlooked? Because time clips so fast now. Sometimes I'll go on TikTok, you know, just to see, you know, what the youth are doing. I'm not even that old. I'm 30. I'm 31. All right. So just to see what y'all are doing. And it's funny because the people on TikTok will say, oh, I just discovered this new thing that people were doing like three or five years ago. So I'm like, whoa, like time must be just turning so fast that people think these old ideas are new again. So if you could turn a forgotten old idea into a crazy new one, that really is a double win. And the next one, y'all, just learn, if you can help it, only be humbled once in each condition. Don't make the same mistake twice. Just humble yourself once because you turn a micro failure into a macro win. And there's another thing is, uh, I personally don't think you necessarily have to love your work. I think you have to be good at it though. And in the beginning, if you're, if you're working on something you don't necessarily love, that's totally fine. But I do think you could find some ways to make sure at initially that it doesn't bring you distress or you're very good at it. So it helps you essentially to lead uh, and free up more time in your life. Um, 
So I have a lot of these musings, but I want to turn to this last lesson and then a quick five minutes and then open it up for hopefully Q&A. But essentially, this is the lesson I want to share, especially when you're going on social entrepreneurship. Build your team. You can't, you're not going to be successful without your team. It's one of the most important things that you can kind of cook up. Your EQ, because relationships matter, your EQ, or essentially your emotional quotient, sometimes is, is, will be more important than your IQ, whatever, how smart you are, that type of thing. Build your relationships. Build your relationships. You're not going to get anywhere without quality relationships. It doesn't have to be a nepotism thing, but building your relationships is super vital. And move an inch at a time fast. You know, especially when you have these ideas, don't, please don't wait. Don't wait. You don't, you know, you could stall perhaps because sometimes, you know, the cultural climate or my Lou or however you want to describe it just might not get caught up with you, especially if you're a forward thinker, but continue to build in private, tinker the artist's way, move an inch at a time fast, man. And then the dark matter theory of success. There's a lot of ways for you to be successful without having to be front facing. So, you know, in this world of the internet age, you know, I like to say, you know, they, they say dark matter makes up the majority of the universe. There's a lot of things behind the scenes that make up, um, can make up the majority of success. So definitely take the time to, to look into that if you're more of the, you know, shy, bashful type. The thing too, because I want you all to take care of yourself, especially from a young age, is kind of musings on self. You know, Tori, Tony Morrison, you know, one of the best out there, which, you know, one of her favorite quotes of mine is about love, about loving, love your hands, love them, raise them up, kiss them, touch others with them, pack them, stroke them on your face, love your mouth, this is flesh, you, you all can read this. But it's all a thought process of like, yo, it's not even, you know, indulging self-love, but it's like, if you're not going to find love in yourself and take care of yourself, what's the point, man? You got one body and one mind to live your entire life. It's like, what's the point? If you're not going to take care of yourself, you know, you know, and I know at a young age, it's easy to feel invincible. Like, what's the point? So I have this thought process of art. And if anybody knows with art, you'll probably see a piece of art. And you'd be like, why do I even like this? What's, why do people like this? What's the point? And there's a lot of different taste methods on art. But for art to be valuable, you only need one person to find value. In, and that's the same with you is that you should only have one person who needs to find value in you for you to be worthwhile. And that one person who should find value in you is you. And of course, whatever, you may get higher appraisals out in the world. You know, that's why your friend groups and things like that are important. But look, man, be your own art appraiser, yo. Like you, you wake up every day, look your ass in the mirror and be like, damn, yo, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Picasso. I'm a bank, not a Picasso, because I guess with whatever that type of art, yeah, the body parts all over the place. Hopefully you're a little bit more dimensional than that but find some value in yourself. So with that, it's pretty simple. You know, you're gonna die. Unfortunately, that's the way the cookie crumbles. So if we're gonna die, why not learn how to take care of ourselves? Because, you know, whatever, memento mori, you know, remember your death and this thought process of not to be morbid and, and to harp on that process, but to say, I am in this, in this process of, you know, whatever, in this process of life, you also understand there's an ebb and flow of existence. And if we're going to die, just learn to take care of yourself. And it also, you know, can make things a little bit easier because it shouldn't be as intense. And then from there, what we really want to just talk about is focus on three core areas. This is all as we bring it all together. We talk about work. We talk about this. We talk about heroes. We talk about ideas. Da, 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 da. But you go, you wake up with, no, nah, not all the time. I guess we all don't, you don't wake up with yourself all the time, but you wake up in yourself all the time. And focus on three areas, y'all. Please, just focus on three areas. Your physical wellness, right? So that's your diet and your physical activity. Now, let's not even call it a diet. Let's call it the way we eat, how we nourish ourselves and our physical activity. Our mental wellness, which is basically how do we build our resilience? How? How do we do that? How do we, whether it's therapy, whether it's with meditation, whatever, how do we build our resilience to stress and an emotional wellness, which is basically how do I foster deeper connections outside of say just work or school 
And those three core areas before, you know, we start to branch out into a few of those others, but those three core areas, if you learn that when you're young, it'll make your life immensely better. It'll, it'll make you be able to live longer. It'll make you be able to feel better, but not just this thought process that we could live long, but so we could also live well now. So there's so much out there and I could talk about so many things here, but I will spare you. But I just simply want you to say, begin your health journey in these three areas, please. Pay attention to what you're eating, pay attention to how you're sleeping, pay attention to the environments you put yourself into, pay attention to your emotional well-being, pay attention to your mental well-being, because that's, that's at the end of the day what's kind of be, you know, the most important. So just quick clothing, closing thoughts. Um, which is basically, oh, I guess I forgot, here we go. If you can help others do it, yo, please, if you can help others do it, if you can help others overcome inertia, if you can help your friend, if you can help your loved ones, if you can help do all those things, you'll be able to do that and be able to get that stuff done. So if you can help others, please do so, because that'll be that, that, that'll be one of the best things that you can do. And again, you can help, you can help others feel better about that. And then from there, there might be more time, but there's no more now. So for real, yo, it's just like, everybody just thinks tomorrow, 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 the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. I like to call this the serotonin versus the dopamine. Is that the serotonin is kind of the, you know, the, the here and now kind of, the here and now kind of moment. It gets you into the today. Dopamine, we always want that next dopamine hit. We want to strive, we want to figure out what's next. You know, go for, you know, but sometimes go for a walk, call a loved one, really just enjoy the now because these are the moments you're not really going to be able to get, you know, you're going to unfortunately not be able to get back because the future is nothing more than the present moment arriving. So we figure out how to feel better in the now. That'll be some of the best things that we'll be able to do. So that, you know, I just kind of wanted to just then also, of course, thank you, but just bring it full circle. I just want to have some Q and A's. I just want to really just be able to bring this thought process of sustainability of self. How do we take the sustainability angle? How do we look at the things that we could possibly do? Of course, for our work, of course, how to make the world a better place, but also how can we do it so we wake up every day and we feel better? And that is a constant, unfortunate and fortunate journey of becoming. How do we make ourselves feel better while we were here and of course, that starts with your health in multiple capacities, but also those wellness strategies that are exceedingly important. So don't overlook those just so you can get a paper done. Because at the end of the day, that's not really what's going to be the most important thing or that you remember. Of course, do your work well, because that's an output of you. But also never sacrifice your well-being just strictly for some sort of bottom line. Um, because you'll look back, you might, and you likely will regret it, but you also just won't be able to feel your, your best right now. So create your wellness philosophy, create your design philosophy of self and, and be able to build, kind of build that out accordingly for best results. So I uh, just want to take some time to pause here. Hopefully, you know, here's some questions from you all or just some, you know, general thoughts as I'm blinded by this. <laughs> I was going to say, first of all, Joe, thank you so much for sharing. Really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, we want to open it up for questions. We have a few minutes. So um, please feel free to raise your hand, everyone, um, or uh, put a question in the chat bar. I want to make sure to hear from you. I just wanted to um, <clears throat> sorry, shout out the use of the word resilient. I think that's something like, especially in the last few years, has become like an important word to me. Um, and I guess I just wanted to ask, like, what are if you're willing to share a few things that you do to like foster and grow your resilient plant within. <laughs> yeah. I mean, first off, thank you for that question. I mean, for me, I take time. I've realized I've had this, I've had to start slow. So I take time in the morning to take care of me first. So I like to have a buffer to my day and that makes me feel better because for me, I have to psych myself up to, to continue to move on because I think a lot of this stuff we do is pointless. Not even to feel dark, but I think we just go through the motions. A lot of this is pointless. It's like, what's the point? We've, we could have created so many other things, but we created this. So to build my resilience, I have to be honest with how I'm feeling. I have to take time in the morning. So I take 10 deep breaths. I take, and everybody do this with me right now because you've probably been on a computer. So let's do, let's do this real quick. I'm gonna raise it up. Or maybe, just put your hands forward, just like this. Come on, 
everybody, and just roll through your wrists. Just understand how you're feeling. That's all. And take a nice deep breath in and a nice exhale. And then reverse directions to your wrist. And then you breathe while you do that. And then I do the same thing through my ankles. And I do the same. And then I ask myself, what are three things that I'm grateful for? I have a gratitude practice. So basically that helps build my resilience a little bit. And I have a mindfulness practice, I think. And I'll send some books through to super easy, but I take probably 15 minutes a day day to do that or three times a week and then to build your resilience because of course recovering is important but there's also you know make sure you're sleeping and doing those other things but building your resilience I check what I put around me so and also what I put in so if if I don't put myself in situations that don't serve me anymore and then I also you know I'm just super honest with myself and do those basic things that allow me to kind of just like feel better so embrace your I can't I have my practices, but I will say to you is embrace your idiosyncrasies, embrace those things that you think make you feel a little odd and those small things that you do that'll make you feel better and engage in a practice with those. Um, because oftentimes those are the things that will unlock kind of your natural resilience. I have a question. Um, so you talked about like helping people as much as you can um, in any way you can, but you also talked about like that balance of saying yes and when to say no. How do you go about saying no when it's something that you really wish you could do, but you just simply can't make time for it or it's starting to eat away at your own mental health or something like that? Uh, yeah, I think it depends if it's a work thing or it's kind of a, um, or it's like a life thing, personal life thing. Uh, but for me, what essentially that I do is you have to set parameters, right? Because, all right, I have what's called the one, three, five system. And it becomes different if it's with tasks versus with, with people. If it's with people, just be honest. Just be like, yo, I would love to do this, but right now I have a too few many things on my plate. If time opens up, I'll be able to, I'll, I'll be able to free up if it's work, if it comes for work. If it's personal, which is a little bit harder, just have the real conversations because people will have to respect it. Be like, yo, like, I'm just bogged down, I'm getting my ass kicked right now. And then, you know, call it the shit sandwich. Then how do you set up something in the future that then allows whatever to take place? So like today I had to cancel a lunch because I have stuff to do, but I'm like, well, let's set a time for the 23rd, right? So you also provide a solution. So one of the things Virgil always said was if you don't have a solution, don't critique. So I always have a solution. Because that means you're also thinking about the other person, right? If you always have a solution, what are you doing? You're providing a Tylenol. When it comes to work, I have a one, three, five system. I've tried a lot of random productivity systems, but this one helps. What's the one important thing you have to do? What are the three middle tier things, the things that are a mix of important and urgent, which are simply the three things that I do today basically will help me with my medium to longer term goals. I know I'll be moving forward. The one thing is, is the one big important. The five are those five small little tasks that you know have been eating away at you and annoying you that if you just take the time to sit down and do them, you will get them done. And they seem insurmountable, but they're not. So that's how I kind of build out, figuring out what's yes or no. If it's yes, does it fall into the one, three, five framework? If it's no, is it a no because it's zapping away at me or because it's not something that serves me at this time, but is it just essentially I could tweak it into a future? Yes, if that makes sense. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Better question. So you talk a lot about how you use your time and how you incorporate like the eight ways of wellness in your life and how you balance that with work. How do you have time for everything in your daily life to accomplish all of these things? How do you plan out your day? I think that would give me a lot of insight too. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've had various, I think, planning strategies at different points in my career, but I look at it like this, right? So uh, there is the sunken cost associated with things that sometimes you won't have to worry about them later. So an example of that is taxes. You do your taxes at a point, it'll help save your time for a year, for the rest of the year. 
And there's certain things in your life that are very similar to that, right? It's that uh, I may not necessarily have to do them every day, but if I take a, this why there's a concept called periodization in fitness, which is basically you periodize your schedule so that it compounds on each other. So if I say to myself, if I take two weeks to do something, I know that might free up, say, if I strength train for four weeks, I won't have to worry about it probably for the next three months because my strength will maintain itself. So to be able to get things done, there's two things. You have to accept you're not going to be able to do it all, right? So you perform an audit. There's a really good book. I think it's Tom Rath. It's called Strength Finders 2.0. Get that book. It tells you how to work on your strengths to help improve your weaknesses and then not always focus on your weaknesses, but just to shore them up enough so they don't hurt your strengths. We often spend too much time trying to fix our weaknesses when we can either outsource it or we just get it up to, to snuff enough so it doesn't hurt our strengths. So to answer your question discreetly, how I, how I found works for me for building out my day, accepting I can't focus on all those things, but there's this is a, I create what's called the MISO cycle, which is a framework of time where I know I will, I'm working towards a specific goal and the things that I can't work on right now at this period of time, that will be either be the next thing. And then I also time block my day. A lot of other people just try to excess schedule, but I time block. So I wake up and I say, all right, 7.30 to 8.30, that's me time. I'm, I'm, I move, I eat, I eat my breakfast, I meditate or just breathe. Then you have to be in meditation. And I set up blocks of time. All right, maybe for the next hour or two, I'll have a brainstorm. Next two hours, I know I'll have, uh, I have to write a column. Next two hours, I know I'll be on call. I also schedule time to eat. I schedule time for chaos. I time block. Because also those basic human things that we know we need to do that we just overlook, that we let everything else. I schedule going to the gym. I, I don't work out because I'm a work alcoholic. I work out because it's a meeting. I eat because it's a meeting. I know it sounds weird, but like if you don't can't set up time to meet with yourself, what's the point? You're gonna you're gonna keep running around for everybody else. So I call I do something that's called time box um, and that typically works well for me. And then I could at the end of the day, I review my day to kind of see what works and, and, and what didn't work. But just to kind of sum it up, you can't change everything at once. That's what I try to do early on, have a lot of spinning plates, you know, and, and then you feel guilty. Oh, if I'm not working out then, ah, or I'm not sleeping I'm not enough, I'm not done that. I'm going to tell you something very important. There's health versus performance. When you are performing, whether it's you're cramming for an exam, you're coming up with a new idea, you're trying to get your work done, that is to perform. It's not going to be healthy, which is fine because of the times when you have downtime, then when you work on your health so you can perform later. An example of this is basketball players. Basketball players jump high because they have stiff ankles. That's not healthy. But then in the off season, they work on the health of their ankles. So when they need to perform later and they got to get stiff again, they will have a reduced chance of injury and they'll still be able to perform well. So understanding that, you know, was very important for me because, you know, otherwise you'll kind of beat yourself up. But if the goal is to get an A, get that A. And then once that time, you know, opens back up, make sure you take care of yourself. All right, come on, I got time for one more. Let's go. You know, I, you know, this is I'm giving Matt a discount on this. It's free. You yeah, know. I was gonna say thank you <laughs> so much. Do we have any final questions? If there's no final question, Joe, I would love to just uh hear a little bit as you have uh been able to be more selective in your time and be able to say those no's more and be more intentional. How do you continue to stay intentional when you have that seat at the table? And it's so easy to go in that beta mindset and autopilot. Yeah, um, that's a good question. It's, all right, <laughs> as weird as it sounds, it's you have to be a little bit, uh, kind of, uh, you gotta rib it yourself. I kind of wake up every day and of course I review and I think of the things that I want to do and the goals that I want to move forward on. But there's two things that I, I like to say as quick as you got it, the quicker you lose it. And that then it's, I'm, it's basically, a, I'm not special. I'm just, I'm lucky. 
So this thought process of, you know, I think keeping humility by understanding that there are ways that I got in this position that are a little bit outside of my control, but since I am here, let me do the best, the most with it. Because I think it's easy to kind of just get, get caught up. But it's thought process of just not operating on autopilot. Like, look at the world with soft eyes. I took a trip to Iceland for work. And if you ever have a chance to go to Iceland, it's like being on drugs without being on drugs. That's how beautiful it is. Not to say I've done any drugs. No, don't do drugs. But it's very beautiful. And every morning, I would just kind of look at the world with soft eyes and have this thought process of having new beginnings. And I think with that, that's what keeps me a little bit going is that, you know, every day is a little bit of a clean slate. It's like this, I don't know if you're religious, but some people say the Sabbath is a mindset. It's not a day. So the Sabbath is really just knowing that things will be taken care of if you do what you should be doing. So having soft eyes, having a clear mind, and then having a little bit of hustle, we'll, we'll, we'll do it up. So that's, that's, how I, that's how I go about it because, you know, if I'm not going to create my life, somebody else will, and I don't want them to have that much control. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I have appreciated all the insight and wisdom you've shared with the class. Um, one of the things you do so well is continuing to share that wisdom. I mean, whether you talk about snack exercises um, to the, the outreach that you're doing, how can students stay in touch with you? Uh, yeah, I should have put my contact info, but uh, if anybody wants to, you know, my Instagram is at Ocho System. If anybody wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, Joe, geez, LinkedIn, I'm like 45. Um, email me is joe at ochosystem.com. My Twitter is joe holder underscore. And then, you know, exercise snacks is just at exercise underscore snacks. Basically, the exercise snacks thing, and I implore you guys to do it since you're students, is basically just break up your day with intermittent movement. So it's these short, and it's also good for your productivity, your brain, and your health. It's just that if you have five or 10 minutes, you don't think like you don't try to go through the pageantry of going to the gym, especially because you're at home. Just do a quick, either like body weight circuit, go for a walk, get the blood pumping. It, it's just super vital for helping your overall health, but also your mind. But yeah, I mean, if there's any way that I could help, please, you know, reach out via email. If there's any ideas that you have, if there's any just like questions that you weren't comfortable sharing, I like to answer them because, you know, uh, I just want to be the coach, I guess, that I wish that I have, you know, I'm like, I'm like the hood's favorite gym teacher, I like to say, but for like life, like wellness. So yeah, keep up with me if you want. If not, that's fine too. If you got questions, hit me. But yeah, definitely appreciate y'all's time. And um, seriously, take care, take care of yourself, like follow your passions, follow your dreams, figure out what you're good at. It's the process truly is of becoming, you will have some slip ups. I have slip ups every day. You will have some slip ups. So the best thing that you could do is you turn a micro failure into a macro win. I remember the first event that I put on in college. You want to know how many people showed up to it? Zero. Zero people. Zero. But you know what? I learned a lot. So we here, we back, we better. So just keep growing.